As many of you know, I live in Michigan, and we're so lucky here. We have almost 3,300 miles of shoreline all around for the Great Lakes. And anywhere in Michigan, you're no further than 85 miles from a Great Lake. So we really enjoy all the water fun. And of course, I think we have something like 11,000 lakes in Michigan. So we are blessed with water. But you know, I had done a video uh, last year, I believe, I'll put a, a link up here. Um, it was, I thought the next war, major, next major war, would not be over oil or something like that. It would be over water. And one of the reasons I think about that a lot is because I just love having the Great Lakes. And I hate it that some of them are polluted. I, we really have to think of what we're doing for our future generations. So they can experience all the water fun on the Great Lakes. But when I was researching for last week's uh, Chernobyl miniseries article, I uh, came upon an article from this gentleman. This article appeared in the Detroit Free Press in October of last year, and it was written by Keith Malhaney. And I'm leaving a link below this video if you want to read it in its entirety. It was really an excellent article and it went into more things that I'm going to discuss in this video which is why I encourage you to read the entire article. Now when I did last week's video I got some inquiries on people uh, see they wondered if they lived near a nuclear power plant. So I'm putting this map here and as you can see most of the facilities are in the East Coast, in the Midwest, and a little on the West Coast. Here in Michigan, we have three active power plants. One is the Fermi plant, and that's near Newport, um, Michigan, which is uh, more near, well, what we consider the Detroit area where I live. Um, and then we have the Palisade plant, which is near Covert, Michigan. And then there's the Cook Nuclear Facility, which is near Benton Harbor. We actually had one more plant. Um, it was known as the Big Rock plant and it was near Charlevoix, Michigan, which is a beautiful area of northern Michigan. Uh, great place to go if you want a nice vacation. And that plant was actually the fifth plant built in the United States. And it was decommissioned in 1997 at a cost of $390 million. And right now, if you went there, you wouldn't even know there was a nuclear power plant there, except that there is a little museum commemorating it. So decommissioning nuclear plants is uh, really the trend now. Uh, the other alternative energies such as solar and wind power, it seems can be produced at less cost. And so we're seeing more and more nuclear plants shut down. In 2017, for the world, it was 10% of all power was nuclear power. And it's estimated to only be about half that by 2050. So, what happens when you decommission a plant? What happens to all the radioactive material? Well, that's kind of what this video is about. Now, I wanted to show you a map. Um, I told you our plants in Michigan, but I wanted to show you the Great Lakes region for nuclear power plants. And I'd like to quote the article I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Quote, more than 60,000 tons of highly radioactive spent nuclear fuel is stored on the shores of four of the five Great Lakes. In some cases, mere yards from the waterline and still growing stockpiles." Unquote. And then according to Gordon Edwards, president of the nonprofit Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, quote, it's actually the most dangerous waste produced by any industry in the history of the earth. Now, the majority of that 60,000 tons of waste that I talked about is on the Canadian side. 50,000 tons of it on the Canadian Great Lakes side. Now this fuel is so toxic that after 10 years, still it, the level there is 20 times what is needed to kill a person. And uh, even after there isn't as much strength there, just little particles that could escape that could get into our lungs or our water would be devastating. The Great Lakes produce drinking water for over 40 million people. And it's used for a lot of the Midwest agricultural land, you know, where we grow a lot of our crops. 
So, both Canada and the United States plan to have central repositories for the radioactive waste. It was going to be transplanted to one place and stored there. Now, in the United States, it was supposed to go to Nevada, Yucca Mountain. But, believe it or not, the people in Nevada weren't too happy about that. And that was supposed to be happening in 1998, and uh, some people called it the Screw Nevada Bill. But really, it's just been stopped at. Nothing has really happened on that, and probably won't. But over the years, the nuclear power plants have been paying money to the government for the storage. So finally, there was some legal action, um, and the nuclear power plants won. So they are being paid $2.2 million daily because the storage fund is not up and running and they have to keep their own radioactive waste. Now Canada has also planned on having a central suppository and they've narrowed it down to five sites in Canada, two of which again are right on the Great Lakes. So I hope one of the other three sites wins this. And they hope to have theirs up and running by 2040. And, you know, nuclear power is still relatively new, considering things, and so there is no foolproof, tested, long-term facility for radioactive waste. Nobody has one that has been tested over time because of the newest of the industry. So, it's constructed on our best guesses. In the United States, temporary storage facilities um, have been proposed in Texas and New Mexico. And in the Texas one, which could, according to his license, open in 2021, they would have room to store 140,000 tons of radioactive waste. But again, it's temporary. This is only storing it for 40 years. So then you have to think, okay, that waste has to come from the Great Lakes all the way down to Texas, let's say. Well, critics have called this uh, a disaster waiting to happen, a mobile Chernobyl, as they call it, which I thought was pretty clever. And even then, so after it stores there for 40 years, then it has to go to that permanent facility, wherever it may be, and you got another mobile Chernobyl happening, right? So whether there will be storage in these temporary facilities, really, I'm not sure. So how are we currently storing it? Well, it's mainly stored at the site of the nuclear plant. And it's kept in two ways, wet and dry. Now the wet is, uh, the nuclear waste is in a uh, pool and water is circulated through it and it should be kept there for five years because it still is very, very hot and we need to have that water circulating to keep that temperature down. And maintain it. And then after five years it can go to dry storage which are called um, casks and in these storage the uh, there isn't water circulating it's air and the air is circulating passively and they can be stored indeterminately in these dry casks. But it costs money to transport it even at the facility site from the pool to the dry cask and so a lot of facilities have been keeping the radioactive waste in that pool, that wet pool, for longer than five years, and in some case, decades. And what they do is reconfigure the pool so they can compress more and more into it. And so here's a quote from that article. This could make the pools almost as densely packed as the radioactive core. That's a safety concern, critics contend. A catastrophe or act of terrorism that drains a spent fuel pool could cause rising temperatures that could eventually cause zirconium cladding, which are the special brackets that hold the spent fuel rods and bundles to catch fire. So such an accident as that could be worse than actually a nuclear meltdown. Now as I stated previously, that dry cast storage has uh, passive circulating air, so it doesn't rely on machinery. However, if a terrorist was able to blow a hole in that task, then the radioactive waste would escape, and in many cases, right out into the Great Lakes. The 9-11 Commission found that 
the first two sites that uh, Al-Qaeda was thinking of uh, for striking in the United States was actually two nuclear power plants. But they looked at it and thought, you know, there would be no fly zones over it and uh, too much security. So they chose their other sites. However, they were really wrong. At that time, there was not a no-fly zone over nuclear power plants. And in fact, today, it is quasi. Um, all airline uh, pilots and uh, any drone operators are told that they cannot go in the area over the nuclear reactor. However, what happens is if they see someone, then a personnel at the plant has to report it and then the police would stop when the plant, or excuse me, when the plane landed and talk to these people. So it's really not an enforced no-fly zone. So I just wanted to bring up these facts. You know, I, I was at first thinking, yay, you know, these plants are being decommissioned. Don't have to worry about uh, meltdown, right? But in reality, the risk still stays with us just in a different form. You know, way back when, nuclear power might have sounded like a great idea, but I don't think it was well thought out for what happens to all the waste that is generated. So, this really could be a terrorist risk, and Lord knows if there's any accident from one of those wet pools, what it could do to the Great Lakes, or to the oceans, or wherever else nuclear power plants are located. And this is something, uh, a risk that's going on, on all countries that are using nuclear power. Uh, I think it was after Chernobyl that uh, Germany decided, maybe it was for Fukushima, I can't remember which, but anyway, they decided to decommission all their nuclear power plants. But now they're struggling at a way to contain the waste. So I'd love to know if you have any more information on this, or if you live in Texas or New Mexico, and what you think about those temporary sites, or if you live in Nevada, please comment. I always appreciate your comments. This is Prepper Potpourri saying please subscribe, share the knowledge, and thumbs up if you like this video.